If you were to throw two dies and add up the numbers that you get on both of them, what number would you be most likely to get? In this video, we're going to discuss this problem to connect to some very foundational ideas in statistical mechanics, namely microstates and macrostates. So to think about such a problem, it is usually easier to just invert it first. So what number would we be least likely to get? For two dies with six sides, there are two numbers, two and 12, that are least likely. These are the minimum and the maximum numbers that we can get out of the dies. So we need a one plus one to get a two, and we need a six plus six to get a 12. So we need the minimum and the maximum on both of the dies to get this number. And there's only one combination that gives rise to both of these numbers. If we were to look at a number like five, there are many ways to create a five out of sums. We can do a one plus four, we can do a two plus three, then we can switch the numbers, switch which dice we are getting which number on and get a three plus two or a four plus one. So there are four different ways that we can create a five out of these two dice. That's important because if we go ahead and map out all of the numbers that we can get from the two dice, you can see that it already looks like a Gaussian curve, a bell curve. So the least likely things that are to happen are on the extreme ends of the distribution. If we were to look at the probabilities now, to get a one on one dice, we have a one in six probability. To get a one on the other dice at the same time, we just multiply that with that probability and we get a 1 over 36 to roll a 2 on the two dice. If we look at a number like 7 here, we can see that there are six different combinations that we can get a 7. Now, to get a 6 plus 1, the probability is still just a 1 over 6 for the 6 and a 1 over 6 for the 1. So it's still a 1 over 36 to just get the combination 6 plus 1. But there's also a 5 plus 2 combination, which is also 1 in 36. There's a 4 plus 3 combination, which is also a 1 over 36. So there are six different combinations that give rise to the number 7. That means there is a 6 over 36 probability, or just a 1 in 6 to get a 7. And that is the most likely number. Now the terminology for this we can go ahead and call the number that we get in the total, so the number seven here, for example, the macro state of the system. And then we can call the six plus one that we get in order to get a seven, the micro state of the system. So this is called a macro state because we're not really keeping track of what exactly happened with the two dies that made up the system, right? With the macro state, we also need to know that it's a six plus one that gave rise to a seven. So we define a number usually denoted by omega, which is the number of micro states that give rise to a certain macro state. So to give rise to the number seven, the number of microstates would be six, as we just saw. And if we look back at our chart here, we can see that six is the maximum number of microstates that we have in this system. That is why seven is the most likely number to get. This is called the equipartition theorem. Equipartition. And what we are partitioning equally is the likelihood of each of the microstates. But it is the number of the microstates that give rise to the same macrostate that determines the most likely macrostate of the system. So how do we actually connect this to statistical mechanics? Well, let's consider two systems interacting via exchanging energy. So let's say that on the first system here, we have a number n1 of particles in a volume V1, and we can just call this side N2 and V2. 
So we're going to let the systems only exchange energy. No particles can come through and the volumes don't change. So these numbers are all constant. Let's also isolate the systems from everything else so that the total energy within the two systems also remain constant. So we can write E total, which is just E1 plus E2. This is a constant. The question here is, how will the energy be distributed? When will the system reach equilibrium? The most apparent answer might be just saying E1 equals E2, right? Hence the word equilibrium, no more energy exchange. But we need to be careful because the energies would only be equal if the number of particles N1 were also equal to N2 and the volumes of the systems were also equal. If that is not true, then the energy equilibrium will not happen when the energies are actually equal. So let's think about this. Let's say that the volumes are the same, but the number of particles are not the same. What would happen? Well, the particles, let's say they are just colliding, right? Faster particles hit slower particles, which speeds them up. That is how they might exchange energy. So what happens if the particles on the left system are faster than the particles on the right system? They reach equilibrium when all the particles are moving at the same speed, right? So they all have the same energy when they all just have the same kinetic energy. Let's say that the number of particles are equal and the volumes are equal, then okay, all particles have the same velocity and the energies are all equal. If you change the volumes, you confine some of the particles to a smaller space, so they have less freedom to move in. So we can think about this energy exchange as sort of the frequency of collisions being roughly the same everywhere. If you confine particles to a smaller volume, they have no choice but to collide more frequently, right? If they have the same energy as the larger volume. So if, say, the particles on the left side here are confined to a smaller volume, if they have more energy than the particles on the right side, they would collide more frequently with the particles on the right side because they are confined in a smaller volume. They're colliding like crazy in there. So they, they have to give more energy to the particles on the right because those have more space, more freedom to move in. So for them to have the same sort of frequency of collisions, for them to collide at the same rate in a larger volume, they have to move faster. So I hope that's clear. So unless we have everything else be equal with the two systems, we don't actually reach energy equilibrium when the two numbers are equal to each other. E1 and E2 have to be par partitioned differently. So how will it happen? This is where we start throwing the dice. The energy macro state that the total system chooses has to be the macro state that maximizes the number of microstates that can give rise to it. That is quite a mouthful, so let's try to put it into mathematics. We can define the omega function as we did before for the first system in the macro state E1. Cool. Let's do the same for the second system, omega 2 E2. Now we can multiply these two numbers to get the total number of microstates that would give rise to the energy E total. Right? This is just like the way we did with the dice. We multiply the 1 over 6 with the 1 over 6 to go ahead and get the combination 1 over 36 for the total of the two numbers. So once we have this, all we really need to do to lay down all the mathematics is to maximize this function. That's easy enough to do. We just take a derivative and set it to 0 to find an extreme point. But what do we take the derivative with respect to? Well, this is where the equation up here comes to help because we have the two energies add up to a constant at all times, which means only one of them is truly a variable here. So we can just rewrite this as E2 
equals e total minus e1. This is a constant. So just like that, e2 just becomes a function of e1. We can even take its derivative. So just e2 over e1 would be minus 1. Now we have this. So let's pick e1 as our variable and go ahead and differentiate with respect to that. If I do that, and then omega total up here. So this is just derivative with respect to e1 for omega 1 of e1 and omega 2 of e2. First, we need to use a product rule. Let's just also set this to zero while we're here. If we use a product rule, we would get omega 1 over e1 times omega 2 plus omega 1 omega 2 over e1 equals 0. Now we can use a chain rule. So this side is just fine. e1, let me also just write this on the left. Better habits. Omega 1. And all we have to do is write a chain rule. So this is omega 2 with respect to e2. And then we have e2 with respect to e1 equals 0. Now we already saw that this is minus 1. So let's just toss this equation onto the right side and we can get omega 2 d omega 1 over e1 is equal to omega 1 d omega 2 over e2. Now we can also divide both sides by omega 1 and omega 2. So we can get 1 over omega 1, d omega 1, e1 equals 1 over omega 2, d omega 2 over e2. And if you know about differential equations, we have just separated the equation so that all the omega 1, e1 stuff are on the left and all the omega 2, e2 stuff are on the right. Now, another thing from differential equations that we can borrow is if you were to differentiate, say, an ln u with respect to x, you can just use a chain rule and say that this is ln u with respect to u times u with respect to x. So the derivative of ln u is 1 over u, and then we have u over x here. This looks just like what we have up here. So whenever you see the reciprocal of a function and then its derivative multiplied this way, you can just recognize that this is an LM function. So we can go ahead and rewrite this condition as d ln omega 1 over e1 equals d ln omega 2 over e2. And this is it. This is how you reach energy equilibrium in statistical mechanics. You just have to maximize the number of microstates and this equation just pops up. This is exactly what we have done with the dyes to get the most likely number. Just by doing that with the energy of the particles, this is the kind of equation that we get. So. Again, just to visualize what this tells us, if I were to redraw two systems here, E1 and E2, these two are interacting. So let's say we have 90% of the energy here and 10% of the energy on the right side. So after interacting, it's okay to get 90% here and 10% here. It's not that this is impossible, it's just very unlikely because there are so few microstates that can give rise to this happening. So this equation up here is trying to tell us that. And since it is so important, we define a mathematical symbol for these, beta, we just label them, 
So ln omega 1 over E1 is called beta 1. Beta 1 equals beta 2 is what is required for thermal equilibrium. 